Hello, everybody. You are listening to Through Time and Clades. My name is Albert. And I'm Joan. Right. So, uh, today we have the second part of one of our ongoing series. So this one is Dinosaurs, the second chapter, in which I discuss uh, the evolution of crown birds, or modern-type birds. And starting with this um, episode onwards throughout the rest of this series, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to be reviewing uh, each of the major groups of living birds, well, crown birds, and discussing what we know about their major um, or major events in their evolutionary history and uh, some of their interesting characteristics. Um, so today we are going to be looking at one of the two major branches of crown birds. So crown birds split into two major groups as we discussed in the previous um, episode of the series of Dinosaurs the Second Chapter. So one of these groups is the paleonates and the other one is the neonates and today we're going to be looking at the paleonates uh, how does that sound sounds pretty exciting <laughs> all right so i don't know i guess before we get started uh well what do you think about paleonates have you have you seen them much in most i assume mostly in zoos i guess yeah um the closest zoo to us that's been sort of my childhood zoo mm -hmm. is the Virginia Zoo. And they have a pair of ostriches that I've seen quite a bit. Um, and they are really impressive birds in person. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't get very close to them, enclosure-wise, because they're kind of separated by a little moat. Uh, yeah. You can still get a sense of their size, right. obviously being the, the tallest birds in the world today, at mm -hmm. least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have seen emus of course many times uh, yeah they're popular uh, particularly on a um uh bird sanctuaries like the i, I finally got to go to sylvan heights for the first mm -hmm. time they had an, an emu there that was resting right up against the uh, fence and that was kind of cool to see it yeah um, <laughs> you, you get an interesting feeling watching them because you're so used to the birds in your backyard with these sort of smooth sleek feathers mm. Uh, a lot of these types of birds have the very shaggy feathers, of course, and uh, it, it's almost like hair, it's right. like a hairy bird. It, it, it's crazy. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, it um, definitely, in some ways, it does not conform to our typical assumptions of what a what a bird looks like, and flightlessness is one of the kind of very prominent characteristics that are, that is very widespread in the paleonates, and we're going to discuss quite a bit about the origins of flightlessness, and that is origins with an S in this group. Uh, I kind of um, bounced around a few different ideas for the title of this episode, but uh, eventually I went with Goodbye Gondwana, which is the title of a classic commentary piece regarding a paradigm shift in how we think about uh, what we call the biogeography, so the geographic distribution of organisms, uh, not just of this group, but of others as well. But uh, we'll, we'll get to that story when we get there. Um, right, so I guess to start off, uh, I would like to introduce some of the major characteristics of uh, paleonates. Obviously, there are many, and some of them are pretty arcane, so I've only selected a few that are relatively obvious or notable in this context. So the paleonates, uh, the total group of paleonates, so I discussed the distinctions between crown groups and stem groups and total groups in the previous lecture. So the total group of paleonates, which includes both the modern paleonates and all the groups that are more closely related to them than to any other living group, uh, their fossil record is known from the Paleocene and of course, they survive into the present day, the Holocene. As we mentioned in the previous episode of this series, uh, it is quite likely that the paleonates or the paleonate lineage uh, originated way back in the Cretaceous. And in fact, they almost certainly did because we have fossils of neonates from the Cretaceous. So if the neonates 
and the Paleonates had already split at the time, then obviously the members of the Paleonate lineage were around. But we don't currently have any definite examples of Paleonate fossils from the Cretaceous yet. There, there are a few possible uh, fossils that have been suggested uh, that might represent Paleonates or Paleonate lineage uh, birds, but it's not absolutely certain at this point. There are currently, uh, at these undercurrent taxonomies, there are 59 living species of Paleonates, which is a just short of 60, kind of a, <laughs> not, not quite a nice round number, but uh, that's the way it is. Maybe someday someone will split one of the Tinamus and we'll, we'll get 60 or something. <laughs> we'll see. That seems likely, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that kind of thing happens in bird taxonomy all the time. But in any case, that's the, that's the current count based on most of the major uh, taxonomic authorities out there. And the name Paleonate means ancient jaws, and that's based on the skeletal anatomy of their palate. So the modern birds, again, are split into the Paleonates and Neonates, and very early on, um, the, these names are coined in 1900, I believe, very early on, people recognized that uh, at least two different groups of birds had quite uh, recognizably different uh, anatomies of their palate skeleton. Now, it is actually quite difficult to find clear descriptions of exactly how these two different uh, types of palates are different from each other. Like a lot of the books that talk about this, or I guess not not even just books, a lot of the sources that talk about this would say that, oh, they have different palettes, and that, that's probably about it, right? Well, what, what has your experience been? Uh, I've always sort of wondered, uh, well, first off, I have read a lot about, I have read a lot of bird books, mm -hmm. and they do mention like the palette thing here and there, and they'll, I, I noticed that they'll they'll mention the, the vomer mm -hmm. in particular. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that is really as far as they go. Right, right. Um, yeah, it, it is. It is quite tricky to find clear descriptions of this, and uh, I, I don't know if I, I'm going to successfully explain it here, but uh, I'll give it a shot. And I, I definitely kind of had to go into this technical scientific literature to get uh, a lot of this information. It's it's definitely not often uh, explained in uh, popular texts. And, you know, understandably, it's, it's fairly arcane, but still, it, since it is what the group is named after, it seems worth uh, going into uh, for this example. So I have here a figure of uh, the skull of a paleonate bird, and what we're looking at here is we're looking at the roof of its mouth. So the skull has been turned upside down, so the top part of the skull, so the lower jaw is not there. And the front of the skull, so the tip of the beak is pointing upwards, the back of the skull is pointing down here. The part that is shaded in gray on this slide, uh, that is the brain case. And so the palate of a bird, um, I guess more importantly for this, uh, this particular context, the back part of the palate of a bird is composed of five different bones. So there is one lying down the midline um, that is shaded in black here, and that is called the vomer. And then behind the vomer, there are two bones called the palatines. And then behind the palatines, there are two bones called the pterygoids. And these are the main bones that make up the back of the palate in a bird. So we actually have these bones as well. Um, our vomer is not actually exposed uh, in the roof of our mouth because what we have is we also have a secondary palate, a hard, a hard palate of bone that separates the, you know, the mouth from the nasal passages. So in our case, the vomer has kind of been separated from the roof of the mouth, so it, it's it's more uh, it's. It's within our, our nasal passages and makes up the part of the bottom of our nasal cavity now. So our, our vomer is not exposed in the roof of our mouth. 
um, our palatines are. Our palatines are uh, make up the back of our, our hard palate, whereas the front of the hard palate is made up of bones in the front of the snout. Um, in, in birds, they are the uh, maxilla and the premaxilla. And our pterygoids have been fused with our brain case, so uh, they, they're kind of not distinguishable from the, from the brain case in our case. But um, in birds, uh, all of these bones remain mostly uh, differentiated from each other. So in paleonates, what's distinctive about the paleonate palate is that the vomer is very large, and whereas in a neonate bird, the vomer is typically much smaller. And in a paleonate, the vomer is one of the main bones that actually connects the upper jaw to the rest of the skull, or to the brain case especially. So you, you can see, if you look carefully, that um, the brain case here has this long projection that extends, you know, quite far to, towards the front of the skull. And this uh, part sticking out is called the parasphenoid. So technically, it actually counts as a bow, one of the bones of the upper jaw, but it is connected to the brain case and it's fused to the brain case in birds. So I guess, you know, by proxy, it, the, the vomer is what is connecting the, um, the, the jaw to this uh, combination, the, the fusion of bones that make up the brain case. In paleonates, uh, additionally, um, the palatines do not really contribute to the, um, uh, to the connection of the jaw to the brain case, whereas in a neonate, uh, the palatines often do contact the brain case. And in a paleonate, the, um, the palatines and the pterygoids are usually fused or at least sutured to one another, so they, they don't have a mobile joint between them. And so one of the interesting things about neonates is that they do have a mobile joint between these two bones. So obviously in our skulls, uh, we only have one mobile joint in the skull, and that is our jaw joint, basically. But in birds, uh, it is not only the jaw joint that connects the lower jaw to the rest of the skull that is mobile, but the upper jaw is also mobile as well. So a bird's upper beak can actually flex up and down independent of the rest of the skull. And in the neonates, the mobile joint between the palatines and the pterygoids helps them do this. Uh, whereas the paleonates uh, are capable of this flexion too, but uh, it is not as well developed because they don't have this mobile joint between the palatines and the pterygoids. So basically they're, they're kind of bending through the, the bone itself and not they don't have a joint there. We don't usually think of bones as being very flexible, but they actually can be. And lastly, I guess one of the major features of the paleonate palate is that you can see these um, projections from the brain case that are connected to the pterygoids in the back of the skull. And these projections are called the basi pterygoid processes. And in paleonates, these processes are very large. Whereas in the neonates, they're often much smaller. And in some cases, uh, many neonates don't have these basic pterygoid processes at all. So those are the main differences uh, between paleonathus and neonathus palates, I guess. Is, is that reasonably clear? Yeah, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> um, I am curious, mm -hmm. um, is this a feature that's only seen in paleonates or is it more of a ancestral trait? Uh -huh. Right, right. So the name paleonate means uh, ancient jaws because for various reasons it was widely assumed that um, these paleonathus features were primitive, so they were inherited from you know an earlier ancestor of crown birds, whereas uh, it was assumed that neonates kind of changed all these features from the ancestors, so they're a newer form of the palate. And the answer to that is that... Um, we're not completely sure, actually, because uh, we don't know too much about the palates of the close fossil relatives of crowned birds. So things like Ichthyornis, a uh, late Cretaceous toothed, uh, very birdy looking dinosaur. Um, it, it was a very close relative of modern birds, but we, we don't know, we don't have a very complete um, 
understanding of what his palette looked like. So it is actually quite difficult for us to figure out what really is the ancestral condition in modern birds. Now, if we look a bit further back in uh, the lineage leading to modern birds, uh, we do see some of the paleonathus features um, in you know, non-crowned bird dinosaurs. But since our understanding is so limited, it's hard to know where, whether paleonates really inherited these features from such distant ancestors, or if there have been you know, several um, reversals or examples of convergent evolution going on. Now, one feature that does seem to be unique to the paleonates is the very large vomer that connects the jaw to the brain case. Uh, mm. we, we don't seem to see that in uh, stem birds, for example. So that actually seems to be a distinctive paleonate feature. Uh, as for the others, uh, we'll have to wait for better fossils, I guess. Okay. So I guess as far as um, adapt, like reasons for the adaptations, is, is there any idea? Like, why is there a need for such a large vomer? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, the kind of problem with a lot of a uh, crown bird anatomy is that people recognize that these features are there but a lot of the time we haven't done any sort of functional study to figure out why these kinds of features might be advantageous. So uh, we're, we're going to see that a lot throughout this series of lectures. Oh, sure. <laughs> we're going to say these birds can be identified this way, but we don't really know what this feature is for. So it's a, it's a field that's really ripe for new research. Uh, oh, right. Especially since a lot of these bird groups that we're going to see were discovered through genetics. Right, so, that's very true. Or, yeah, yeah. They're related through these particular genes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. That is very true. Now, the, the paleonates have been recognized as a, as a group for a long time, even prior to the rise of genetics um, or molecular phylogenetics. But uh, as we shall see, uh, the molecular phylogenetics has changed their the relationships within paleonates quite a bit. Something else that's uh, pretty interesting about paleonates is that uh, the males are often the primary or only caretakers for their young. So what happens in a lot of paleonates is that a single male will mate with many, many females. So the females will come to him, and if he's to their liking, they will lay their eggs in his nest. And so he ends up with potentially dozens of, of babies and he takes care of them, he protects them. Uh, you, usually, usually they can uh, walk around and feed by themselves not long after hatching, but uh, he might show them you know, what things are uh, good to eat and what things aren't, um, and lead them around to find food resources, water resources, and um, protect them from predators. Um, that is the case for most paleonates, but in ostriches, what happens is that one of the females that the male mates with will actually stick around and help him take care of the young. So uh, they have biparental care, where both the male and female are caring for the young. But in most of the other paleonates, um, either the male does it by himself, or he has some help from the female, but he's still doing most of the work. So that's quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, it has actually been suggested that this is an ancestral characteristic for crown birds. Some people have argued that uh, in stem birds, so if you look at some of the non crown bird dinosaurs, things like oviraptorosaurs and troodontids, people have contended that there is evidence that these dinosaurs um, had what we call paternal care, so males being the primary care caretaker for the young and that paleonates have inherited this. And there's some evidence for this, although it, it is somewhat controversial. So it is, it is possible that uh, paleonates have retained this behavior from a much more distant ancestor. And lastly, I guess, um, it, it's worth pointing out the term ratite, which you will see a lot in you know, literature about birds. Uh, the term ratite 
usually refers to the members of paleonates that are flightless. So things like ostriches and emus and rheas and so on. And usually excluding the flying tinamous, although some, some people have used it as the same thing as paleonates, so it really depends on who you ask. But most of the time if you see the word ratite, it's referring to the flightless members of this group. And the word ratite means raft, and they're actually named after the fact that their sternum, so their breastbone, does not have a keel running down the middle. Now, if, you, if you've if you eaten a, a turkey or a chicken with the bones still there, turkey or chicken breast, you, you might have noticed that there is a large keel running down the middle of the breastbone, where a lot of the large flight muscles attach. But oh, since, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but since the uh, ratites don't fly, they have kind of lost the sternal keel. And since the term raft is uh, the name for you know, a watercraft that does not have a keel down its bottom, that's where the word ratite comes from. That's interesting. I, I definitely, I've read more about that ratite distinction mm -hmm. in the literature than the, the more modern understanding about the, uh, the vomer. Right, the yeah. Ancient mm -hmm. character. Yeah. So I, I, I'll attest that I, I've been lazy and, and lumped Tina Moo's into ratites as well. Well, some some other uh, people do, including working researchers. So I, I think you're okay with doing that. Um, I'm doing good. But but yeah, mo most of the time when people say ratite, they 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 mean the flightless forms. And I, I guess uh, it is much easier to explain the whole sternal keel thing than to explain the details of the palate anatomy, which is why most people prefer to to talk about the the sternal keel instead. Um. And traditionally, it was thought that all of the flightless paleonates uh, were more closely related to each other than to the Tinamous, but that's a story we'll get to later, because as it turns out, uh, they're not. <laughs> uh, so on the next slide, I have another image of the, um, the palate anatomy, just to make it hopefully more clear, I guess. So what we're seeing here is a close-up of that region of the palate, and in this figure, the front is towards the left of the screen and the back is towards the right of the screen. And you can see the vomer, uh, there's an arrow there that's showing where it, the part of the vomer that is attaching to the uh, uh, parasphenoid projection of the brain case on top. And you can see that uh, the palatines on either side it's labeled os pal, so os palatinum, which is the fancy word of saying palatine, <laughs> or even fancier, I guess you could say. The palatines are not connected to the brain case. They are excluded from this connection by the vomer and the pterygoids in the back, the os ter labeled here. And the base pterygoid processes that come off the brain case are very large and attached to the pterygoids. So, Hopefully that is a good review of that concept. All right, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no. All righty. Okay, so I guess for the rest of this um, lecture, or much of the rest of it, I'm gonna um, go through each of the major groups of recent paleonates. So the living groups of paleonates, but also some that were living until very, very recently, so they went extinct a few centuries ago, that kind of thing. So we'll, we'll go through the groups of, I guess you could say, modern paleonates. So first up, we have the ostriches. And as we shall see, the ostriches have a reasonably rich fossil record, although we don't know very much about their very early history. Uh, we do have many fossils of ostriches from the Miocene onwards. So, you know, ballparking here, like think 15, 17 million years ago or so. So the total group of ostriches extends, um, or the fossil record of them at least, extends back at least that far. There are two living species of ostriches. Until recently, they were considered one species, but um, now they have been split into two species. And currently ostriches are found in Africa although up until very recently they were, they were also found in the Middle East. So I, I think they went extinct in the Middle East in the 1960s or something like that, which is astonishingly recent. 
And in the fossil record, they can also be found in other parts of Eurasia. So Southern Europe, um, Mongolia, China, Russia, there are fossils of ostriches found in all of those regions. And also fossil eggshells from India. And ostriches are rather superlative birds, you could say, because they are the largest living birds. And, you know, with all the other uh, associated superlatives that come with that, so the heaviest and the tallest, uh, they can get up to around two meters tall, I believe, and um, around the, the, that part. They also lay the largest eggs of any living bird. In fact, um, I've heard that a person can stand on an ostrich egg without breaking it because the shell is that thick. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, think of how many omelets you can make from, from an ostrich egg. People actually do, do eat ostrich eggs, and, you know, you could serve, like, many people with one ostrich oh, egg. <laughs> I, I think I actually read recently that yeah. it's the equivalent of, of, like, a dozen eggs. I, I think so, yeah, right. <laughs> I wonder if it's any good. <laughs> I know, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of curious. <laughs> and ostriches um, are very, very specialized for running. And kind of one of the adaptations they have for this is that they only have two toes on each foot, which is very unusual in birds. Now, typically, most birds have four toes, and this is something that they share with all the other theropod dinosaurs, four-toed feet. Now, in most theropods, the innermost toe is quite small and it's held off the ground, whereas in birds, uh, it is typically kind of rotated around the foot so that it points backwards and helps them grab onto branches and uh, does often touch the ground. But ostriches have lost this uh, innermost toe entirely, so it's the equivalent of our big toe. And in, in addition to that, they have also lost the outermost toe, so they only have two toes left. And toe reduction is a common uh, adaptation in animals that are specialized for running. So you're kind of um, reducing, you know, the the drag by your by your foot because you're making it, uh, the, I guess, the drag uh, induced by moving your foot because you're uh, making the foot narrower, and also you're packing more force into a smaller area when you're uh, pushing off from the ground. So as gives you more propulsive, you know, benefits. And for some other examples of this, you can look at hoofed mammals, for example. Obviously, most famously in horses, there is only one toe left on each of the on each of their feet. And it's a very similar idea here with the ostriches. So ostriches, um, due to their very specialized running adaptations, they are also the fastest running uh, two-legged animals alive today. So they're basically uh, birds trying to be horses, which is pretty neat. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if uh, they're rideable like horses. Yeah, people do ride ostriches. I, 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 I'm aware of that. Um, I think you usually uh, it's relatively small riders who, who do so, but uh, it, it can be done. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is pretty cool. Um, there, There's a common myth, I guess. I, I, I think probably most people who know a thing or two about birds know that it's a myth. But, you know, ostriches do not actually bury their heads in the sand to hide from predators. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder but, if that was one of Aristotle's things. Right, like, yes. Kind of stuck through the years. You're right, yes. It's, it's a very, very ancient myth. But uh, obviously being such great runners, uh, living in Africa, a land of many large predators, um, they, they do not uh, <laughs> need to resort to hiding their heads in the sand to escape from predators. They can just run away from most of them. Common sense to that too. Cause it, it's like, <laughs> if you think about it, for just a little bit, it's like if this bird, if these birds were just sticking their heads in the sand whenever things got in trouble, they probably wouldn't have made it past the Miocene. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> it probably would have been wiped out as soon as you know they had to come in contact with large predators. 
And uh, if they have to, they can also unleash a quite uh, powerful kick, which can you know, kill people. Uh, anecdotally, it can kill lions as well. So certainly a very um, potentially effective defense. Oh yeah, never underestimate the ostrich. <laughs> right, right. So um, on the next slide, I talk a little bit about the fossil record of ostriches, which I, which I guess I kind of have already. Um, fossil bones and especially eggshells of ostriches are very common from the Miocene onwards in the parts of Africa and Eurasia that I mentioned earlier. And some species of ostriches uh, in the fossil record are known to have been much bigger than even the living ostriches. So quite recently, um, there were new specimens of an uh, extinct ostrich-like bird um, it was probably a close relative of ostriches, although I, I don't think anyone's really done a phylogenetic analysis, so it's hard to be completely sure, but some kind of ostrich-like bird uh, called Pachystruthio, which was found in southern Europe and also the kind of nebulous boundary between uh, Europe and Asia. And some of these bones suggest that they could get up to over 400 kilograms. Um, and for comparison, I guess a modern ostrich gets up to uh, over 100, I, I guess they could get up to 170 kilograms, I think, um, almost 200 kilograms. So this is something that's more than twice as big as a modern ostrich. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> massive. Um, and you can you can see the comparison here on the on the figure. On the left is the femur, so the thigh bone of Pachystruthio, and on the right is a modern ostrich. So Pachystruthio lived until the early Pleistocene, I think, uh, which was around the time that the genus Homo actually entered Eurasia, I believe. Am I right? Yeah, that's about right. Right, yeah. So potentially, you know, when Homo erectus was going into Eurasia, <laughs> it met these gigantic ostrich-like birds. So uh, one wonders what kind of interactions they might have had. <laughs> probably not very fun ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> For either party, potentially. It's the closest we get to those caveman movies where the dinosaurs are still running around. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, right, right. Encountering gigantic dinosaurs. Like, oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, Ostrich fossils are known from outside of their historical range, so outside of um, Africa and the Middle East, um, until at, as late as the late Pleistocene. So there, there are fossils of like ostrich eggshells from India that are uh, late Pleistocene in age, I think. So they survived quite recently uh, in this very widespread range, but they probably died out during the Pleistocene megafaunal extinctions of which the cause is quite strongly debated, but in many cases was probably probably linked to the spread of Homo sapiens around the world, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, as we shall see, is kind of a recurring theme. <laughs> okay, let's look at the next group of uh, living paleonates. So next up I have the Rias. Uh, the Rias, uh, their total group, uh, is known possibly from as early as the Eocene. And I have on the next slide a picture of some early Rhea fossils or possible Rhea fossils um, from that old. But definitely um, they are also known from at least the Miocene onwards. There are several species of fossil Rhea that have been named. There are only two living species right now. One is called the Greater Rhea and one is called the Lesser Rhea. Though guess which one's bigger? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the, in the bird world, <laughs> right? Quite Greener straightforward. The notion of of worth, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> yeah, the, the lesser Rhea is also called Darwin's Rhea. So, um, there's also that. The greater Rhea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. What, what were you saying? Oh, I'm sorry. It's like those are the ones that Darwin would have encountered on right. his travels. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the greater Rhea is the largest living bird in South America. Uh, it is not nearly as big as an ostrich, but it, it can get, I think, 
over 20 kilograms, uh, and, you know, over a meter tall. So it's still a pretty decently sized bird. I've seen them in zoos. Yeah, they're pretty big. I've not had that fortune yet. Oh, really? Okay. Well, yeah, um, they're pretty decently sized. And in fact, they're they're in about the same size range as a velociraptor, although they, they would have been quite a bit, or Rhea's would be quite a bit taller than velociraptor due to their very long leg and neck. But in, in terms of their uh, body mass there, they would, would be about the same size. So a greater Rhea would probably be about the size of a large velociraptor, and a, a lesser Rhea would be about the size of a typical velociraptor. So that's kind of neat. They are only found in South America, and so, so far uh, their fossil record seems to be limited to South America as well. And like ostriches, they are cursorial. Uh, they do not have uh, just two toes on their feet. That's a pretty uniquely ostrich thing, in, uh, among living birds at least. But they have lost the innermost hallux, or the first toe, so they only have three-toed feet. Uh, also, like ostriches, uh, their wings are relatively large for a um, flightless bird. Now, you probably can't really tell from this um, this photo because the, the wing feathers kind of blend in with the rest of the body feathers. They, they don't, they're not really differentiated like in modern, uh, not modern, uh, flying birds. But uh, the length of the wings is actually relatively large in both the rheas and the ostriches. And this might be helpful uh, for maneuvering during they're very fast running, so they can flick out a wing to help them turn better, things like that. So, There's probably some convergent evolution going on there. Right, yes, because traditionally it has been thought, because of these shared features, that uh, it's quite likely the rheas and ostriches uh, are close relatives, but as we shall see, it turns out that's not the case, and this, these are probably convergent between them, which is mm. quite uncanny, because they, they do look pretty similar. Yeah, I've seen a lot of older work. I think even in, in uh, The Voyage of the Beagle, Darwin yeah. just straight up like, oh, these are the South American ostriches. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and on the next slide, I have this um, very old uh, potential stem rhea. Again, stem groups and crown groups. You'll have to remember those uh, concepts as we go through this, uh, this entire series. Uh, and this uh, old stem rhea is called Diogenornis. So it's, it doesn't, may, maybe the figure doesn't look, look like too much, but this is actually a pretty decent specimen for, or, or series of specimens for a, for a fossil bird, because bird skeletons are pretty fragile and they often aren't very complete. But we have several uh, bones from the hind limbs here, and also part of the beak. So the one that's labeled F is again part of the beak here, uh, claw and uh, bottom of the foot. So a reasonable sample. Uh, it does have quite a few similarities to the modern uh, Rhea, although it, uh, we're, we're not completely sure if it really is one, but it, it is quite plausible that it, this is a stem Rhea. All right, let's go to the next group. The next group is a group called Cassuariformes, and this group includes both the emus, of which there's only one living species, the emu, and the cassowaries, of which there are three living species. The uh, cassowariforms are currently only found in Australasia, so Australia, Papua New Guinea, and a few of the other small islands in that region. They are known, uh, in terms of their fossil record, from since the Oligocene, and so far all of the fossils of cassowariforms um, are considered to be members of crown cassuariformes, so we don't have any stem cassuariforms known yet. So all of these fossils would have been either more closely related to the emu or more closely related to the cassowary than to you know the other major lineage of members of the crown group. Now, as we shall see, it's mostly uh, the emu lineage that has left more fossils. And there's probably a reason for that. Uh, unlike the rheas and the ostriches, the forelimbs of emus and cassowaries are very, very small. So, in fact, they're basically usually, most of the time, they are buried underneath the uh, the, the body feathers. Uh, you, you could kind of see them sticking out of the emu in this photo here. So, you know, the, that 
that part near the base of its neck that kind of droops down. Those are little wings. <laughs> and in the cassowary, uh, if you can't see it in this photo, go go look at a cassowary photo later. But uh, you might be able to see kind of these uh, slightly thicker feathers that are um, projecting out uh, near uh, the leg that's closer to us in this photo. They, they have a series of kind of thick quills uh, that come off of the wings. So these are the remnants of their wing feathers. And I, I don't think anyone really knows what these quills are for. So it's kind of a weird feature that they have. And again, mostly, most of the forelimb is buried underneath the, the body feathers. Yeah, I remember seeing photos of the emu's arms. Uh -huh. And yeah, they're, they're wimpy things. <laughs> it's like, it's like a pinky finger with a little claw. Yeah, you're right. Barely any muscle. It just kind of hangs like, like a, like a limp. Almost. Right, right. Very bizarre. Yeah, very unusual. Now, in spite of these uh, quite tiny wings, emus are also quite cursorial. And in fact, the cassuariforms have also lost the innermost uh, toe. So again, three-toed feet here. And yeah, the emus, they are more cursorial than the cassowaries and tend to live in more open habitats. Whereas cassowaries can can they can run pretty well, but you can you can tell from the photos here the the feet are much stockier and relatively shorter than in the emu. And cassowaries prefer to live in forests. In fact, they eat a lot of fruit. They eat fallen fruit from trees, uh, and they are very important as seed dispersers in the forests where they live because they are you know pretty much the only large animal there that's eating fruit, and um, yeah dispersing seeds far and wide. Cassowaries have a number of quite distinctive and unusual features. One of them is this bony, what we call a cask on the head, which is, of course makes them immediately recognizable. It is actually still, I think, quite debated what this cask actually is for. Right. I, I've seen conflicting studies mm -hmm. where they've dissected into it and they haven't really come to a consensus at all. Yeah, exactly. It's like you'll read sometimes like, oh, it's a it's a helmet. You know, right. birds run through the forest and they, 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 they put their head down in a way so that the branches kind of, you know, push off of it. Right. Which doesn't really seem convincing. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that I, that was that was definitely the um, the explanation that was most familiar to me uh, in my childhood books. Is that yeah, the, this is this would be a helmet, and it would allow it to run through the forest and you know, deflect uh, branches and foliage in the way things like that. Um, yeah, there have been quite a few relatively recent papers about the anatomy and the uh, the growth of the the cask. Uh, one of them was co-authored by our friend the British paleontologist Derrick Nash. And in that paper, uh, they they pointed out that the inside of the cask is, you know, quite soft and spongy. So it doesn't seem likely that this cask has a protective function the the way described in those, you know, uh, popularly described in those sources. Yeah. So they, they suggested it was more likely functioning in display of some sort. Not not only visual display, but perhaps even uh, uh, to help enhance or amplify their calls, because emus and cassowaries are uh, they they make very interesting vocalizations. They make very very deep calls. Uh, in fact, they, their calls are are so deep they can extend into the infrasonic range. Wow! <laughs> and they're they're one of the few birds that do this, I believe. Have you ever heard an emu call? Uh, yes, it, it's, uh, how do I describe it? It's like, uh, the softest drum yeah. you can think of that just kind of continues re repeatedly and rapidly. Right. So they, uh, they, uh, were inspired by that. It was a recent study. They, they were inspired by that to kind of think about how Tyrannosaurus mm. may have vocalized. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's likely now that it probably wasn't doing these lion roars that you see in movies mm. and stuff. 
Um, and so it probably did sort of a closed mouth vocalization sort of thing, mm -hmm. akin to what a, an emu or a cassowary does. And, right, right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you hear an emu's call, like, imagine that scaled up, and it's it's just as scary as it, a, it, a Yeah, emu. it would probably, like, vibrate through your body or something like that. Oh, yeah, it's like, oof. <laughs> <No> <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah. That is definitely inspired by the calls of large archosaurs today. So these guys, but also a crocodilians as well, also are known to make very deep, closed mouth vocalizations. Yeah, at the um, the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., uh, I used to visit that pretty often when I was doing my undergrad at the University of Maryland. And they had an emu who has, uh, I believe, unfortunately since passed away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I saw him many times and something he loved to do was that he would pace alongside the edge of his fence alongside you. He would take a walk with you along the edge of the fence. <laughs> yeah. And so I did that with him many times. And he would often make that kind of deep, soft rumbling noise while he was doing it, which is really cool to see and hear. So, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty cool thing that these birds do. Uh, I guess something cassowaries are also infamous for is that they are one of the few known birds confirmed to have killed people. Now, the, the ostrich would be another example of that, or ostriches. But uh, the cassowaries are especially uh, infamous for it. They have a very large uh, claw on their innermost toe. So remember, the, their first toe has been lost, so this is actually the equivalent of the second digit. Uh, yeah, I've I've seen photos of this claw, uh, and you can't really see it in the photo here because of the grass, but it is long and scary looking. <laughs> right, I, I I've definitely seen it um, associated with the claws of the dromaeosaurs. Mm, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah. I understand that it, it it was not used in the same way. No, no. Like, yeah, mm. right. The the claw in a cassowary is a lot more uh, straight or straighter than the than the curved claw in a, in a dromaeosaurid. So pro probably weren't uh, quite, uh, weren't used in quite the same way, but uh, kind of having a similar idea of the main weapon being on the second toe. Uh, it should be said that this uh, reputation of cassowaries is a bit overblown. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, within the past century or something, there have only been two confirmed cases of people being killed by cassowaries, and they're mostly under quite exceptional circumstances. Like, in in one case, the person killed was trying to kill the cassowary, so uh, <laughs> well, can't really fault the cassowary for for that. <laughs> um, most of the time, if they can, they will try to avoid people. They they're not going usually not going to run after you and attack you aggressively unless they have unfortunately been habituated to, to people. Right. And I have to confirm this, but I, I'm fairly certain that some indigenous groups in New Guinea mm -hmm. have sort of taken in, or historically at least have taken yeah. in categories as, as almost like pets. Right. Some yeah. I, I've, I've, right. I, I've heard about that too. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it, you know, they're, they, like any large animal, they should be treated with respect, but they're not like super murder, <laughs> murder birds that are come, coming after you all the time or something like that. Oh. <laughs> you, can, you can argue that for most animals. You're right, right. <laughs> so when it comes to the fossil record of the cassowary forms, uh, there isn't too much for cassowaries, and that, that's probably because they mostly live in like tropical forests, which are not good environments for preserving fossils. But we do have quite a few fossils from the emu lineage. And so you can see a few examples here. These are the tarsometatarsus, or the foot bone uh, of these birds. So in, in birds, uh, some of the ankle bones have fused together with the long bones on the feet. And so we call this uh, the tarsometatarsus. So combine the tarsus, the ankle, versus the metatarsus, the long bones of the foot. Uh, so literally combine those words together and because that's what the bone is made of. <laughs> 
so here are several examples of um, fossil emus or stem emus compared to a modern emu on the right. Uh, that's letter D. And you can see that most of these uh, fossil emus are actually smaller than the modern emu, and they probably had somewhat shorter legs, so they, they weren't quite as cursorial as the modern emu and were mostly smaller birds. So one of these fossil emus is called emu arius, which is have a combination of emu and cassuarius, which is the genus of cassowaries. So uh, I think I, I've seen people nickname this bird the emuary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then I, I guess that you know that, that's basically what its uh, scientific name means. So it's appropriate. And yeah, you can see it's it's somewhat um, in some ways intermediate in the morphology between the cassowary and an emu. Yeah, the the legs are pretty gracile and slender like an emu, but uh, not, not quite as long as in an emu. There are two species of emu arius known, so both of them are shown here. And the letter C here is a, uh, has been assigned to the modern emu genus Dromaeus, but uh, it is an extinct species of Dromaeus, not the living species. So it's found a bit later in time. So, you know, a decent uh, emu fossil record by bird standards. Yeah, and as I understand it, there are some historical populations for emus at least. That That's true. Died out. Um, I think Tasmania used to have emus, but they're all gone. That's correct. Yes, yeah, there, there used to be emus on some of the surrounding islands of Australia, including uh, Tasmania, but uh, they died out in historic times. And uh, some of those um, island emus were once considered separate species from the modern emu, but I think the current consensus is that they are not, they are the same species, uh, although, uh, you know, distinctive populations, so subspecies, if you will. Mm. All right. In our next group, we have our first example of a, an extinct group, but one that has been extinct for, I guess, only a few centuries. And these are the elephant birds. We're actually not entirely sure of when they went extinct. There are anecdotes that might refer to them from as late as the 17th century, but it's possible that they had already gone extinct before that. There um, has been a recent taxonomic revision of elephant birds. So the taxonomy of elephant birds has historically been very, very messy, but most recently there are four species recognized. And so far, they're only known from Madagascar. They include the largest known birds ever. And so this new uh, taxonomic revision named a new genus. They assigned the largest specimens to a new genus called Varambe, which basically means big bird. Quite straightforward. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> and they found that, or at least they estimated, that Vrombe could get to at least over 600 kilograms. It's a massive bird. <laughs> yeah, that's almost. Yeah, that's, that's impressive. <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess it also, it also bears in mind um, the term elephant bird. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe is inspired by uh, Marco Polo's expedition. I believe so, yes. <laughs> he, he brought back these stories. Um, I, I believe it's folklore from Central Asia mm -hmm. or the Middle East somewhere of, of, of these giant birds that were so massive that they could carry off elephants. Right. Um, I, I believe it's like the rook. Or the yeah, rock. it's called the, the rock, yeah. Right, and so that's sort of the inspiration for this name since these birds are so big. Right, right. Even though they, they certainly weren't big enough to carry off elephants. No, no, and they, they weren't flying anyways. <laughs> nor, <laughs> nor were they carnivorous, but uh, but yes, that it, it, it has been suggested that the legend of the rock was inspired by these birds. And by the way, that's spelled R-O-C, so it's not you know, rock as in uh, stone. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, uh, it's definitely been suggested, uh, in, in fact, it's been suggested that because, uh, you know, these uh, flightless birds probably had these simple feathers that people saw uh, adult elephant birds, but thought they were chicks of an even larger bird. 
and so uh, that kind of that may have fed into the the rock myth <laughs> oh wow <laughs> that's actually really perfect right right <laughs> <laughs> oh, these overgrown chicks. Uh, so clearly the, the mother was even bigger and could carry off elephants. Um, uh, there are um, fragmentary specimens that suggest Varambe could get even bigger than 600 kilograms, uh, possibly over 800 kilograms, which would be absolutely massive. And in fact, as far as we know, uh, Varambe was probably not only the largest known crown bird, but also the largest known Paravian theropod. Uh, so Paravies is a group that includes not only birds, but also the Dromaeosaurids and the Troodontids. And otherwise, the largest known um, Paravian would be um, Utah Raptor from the mm. early Cretaceous, which was about the size of a grizzly bear. But uh, if Varambe could get, you know, in the range of 600 to 800 kilograms, it would probably be even more massive than Utah Raptor. So that is quite impressive. So imagine that the largest known Paravian theropod was an animal that lived only a few centuries ago, not That's millions like, yeah. of years ago. So in fact, um, the paper that uh, made these estimates also pointed out that uh, this is comparable in size to the smallest known adult sauropods, uh, which are, of course, the giant uh, long-necked plant-eating dinosaurs uh, of the Mesozoic uh, and the largest known uh, land animals ever to have lived. Now, the, uh, obviously, the, the largest known adult sauropods would have been super, super massive, the size of herds of elephants, but right. the smallest known adult sauropods uh, could have been around the same size as Varambe, a few hundred kilograms. <laughs> so it's like, that, that's not really a question you expect to hear. What is the, what is bigger, the smallest adult sauropod or the largest adult bird? Like, it's a... <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine the uh, early Malagasy showing up oh, on gosh. the for the first time. Right. <laughs> Just scoping the place out and seeing these guys. Yeah, just, yeah, I imagine that. And elephant birds also laid the largest known eggs of any animal that we know about. Uh, in fact, yeah, lar larger than the sauropod eggs that we know about. So uh, I think it has been estimated that uh, an elephant bird egg would weigh around 10 kilograms. <laughs> now, for, fortunately, these guys, you know, were, were huge. So I guess, I guess relative to them, the egg wasn't quite quite that big, but still. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, de definitely much bigger than an ostrich egg. And I believe, um, you know, like, as you can see from the photo here, uh, like we found a few intact eggs. Mm -hmm. But as I understand it, more often than not, they're found in fragments. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so yes, they we do often find the eggshells instead. Something interesting uh, about the ecology of elephant birds. So we we know um, they seem to have mostly lived in coastal wetlands, where they were the major herbivores of the time. And uh, it seems uh, people have identified some interesting and unusual features of plants from Madagascar uh, that aren't often found in other environments, with an exception that we'll see later. So these plants have some weird features, like what we call divericate or zigzag branches. So yeah, the branches are actually shaped like a zigzag. Um, and also the angles of the branches, they branch off at very wide angles. So what's the significance of this? Well, it has been suggested that these are defenses against being eaten by elephant birds. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it, it, it's kind of kept that out even after the extinction. Right, right. So it's kind of a, what we call an evolutionary anachronism, anachronism or what um, uh, has been termed more poetically ghosts of evolution, where kind of uh, you know, selection pressures that were exerted uh, on an organism 
uh, leave their mark even after those original pressures have disappeared. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what what is the significance of these features? Well, these birds, uh, when these large plant-eating birds eat, what they often do is that um, they will grab onto these leaves and then you know pull them off of the of the plant and of course the plant doesn't like that uh so what these features seem to do is that first of all the divericate zigzag branches the, these branches are not only shaped in a zigzag pattern but they're also they also tend to be very springy so that means if an ele elephant bird clamps onto one of these branches and tries to pull off the leaves, it has to exert a lot more effort to try and pull those leaves off because the branch is going to stretch out and, and spring back into place when it lets go. So it's, uh, it's going to be harder for it to pull the leaves off of a branch like that. And the wide bran branching angles mean that uh, if it takes off, you know, too large a piece of the branch, it makes it very difficult to swallow that branch because the branches are sticking out. And of course, uh, you know, these birds don't have teeth or cutting implements, so they, they would prefer to be able to swallow mouthfuls that they can, they can actually swallow. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. <laughs> so that seems to be the significance of these features. And why don't we see them in other places? Well, uh, in other places, mostly these plants would contend with mammalian herbivores. And mammalian herbivores mostly chew up plants with their teeth, right? So uh, having zigzag branches that prevent leaves from being pulled off doesn't really help there because a mammal would just chew the branch up entirely. And of course, the wide branching angles that prevent you from being swallowed don't really work against chewing either. So what uh, most plants that need to defend against uh, mammalian herbivores often do is they grow big thorns to kind of prick the you know, soft and sensitive lips and tongues of mammalian herbivores which of course would not work against the hard keratinous beak of a bird that's eating plants. So, right. Yeah. And even then, like there are mammals that have found their way around. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Giraffes. Giraffes. And, yeah. Long <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. The, <laughs> the arms race between plants and their predators is actually a quite, you know, surprisingly interesting topic. Oh yeah. But surprise, surprise. Plants are living <laughs> organisms. <laughs> right. Right. The same struggles that animals do so they're actually really cool yeah exactly <laughs> but anyways um elephant birds we we don't actually know too much about their biology other than that uh there there hasn't been as much study done on them as uh, in the other major group of recently extinct um paleonate samoa which we'll get to later so we we don't actually know that much about their biology but we do know they were big <laughs> yeah and very likely um, they died out, you know, shortly after the arrival of humans on Madagascar, unfortunately. Though it's possible some environmental changes led to their uh, decline as well. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's probably a series of things that happened. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. All right. Uh, from uh, one of the largest paleonates to one of the smallest. Uh, let's look at the kiwi. The kiwi are much smaller than most of the other birds we've been talking about. You know, they're, they're about the size of a chicken. And they're only found on New Zealand. Of course, famously, uh, the New Zealand um, New Zealand people have, uh, have taken to calling themselves kiwis. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the kiwi fossil record is not very good, but uh, they are known, or possible, a stem kiwi are known from at least the, the Miocene. Uh, kiwi are very, very weird birds. Uh, so like the cassoriforms, uh, they have very reduced forelimbs. And in this photo, you can't really see the forelimbs at all. Uh, but they're also nocturnal, which uh, is really odd. And you can see that their eyes are very small, so they, they don't really see that well. In fact, people have found kiwis that have gone blind, just living out just fine in the wild, because they, they just don't rely that much on their eyesight at all. They don't really need it. And what they do is that they will use their long bill to probe for food. So they'll poke their bill into the soil, into leaf litter, um, and look for food that way. And so they, they have a very good sense of smell. 
their nostrils, which you can't really see in this photo, are actually found close to the tip of their beak. So they can poke their beak into some substrate and smell and sniff out food. They especially like to eat earthworms. Uh, so yeah, they forage by smell and touch, and they, uh, yeah, looking for worms, insects, occasionally some plant material. Very, very weird birds. Uh, pe people have said that kiwi are uh, basically birds trying to be mammals and compared to like badgers and things like that. So they, they also dig burrows and live, live in burrows, to, uh, sleep in burrows during the day, things like that. So very oh, unusual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they they're, they've reached the, the cuteness factor. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Yeah, yeah, they are. They are very cute. I, I've seen maybe one kiwi ever in my life, like at a zoo, of course. I haven't been to New Zealand yet. It was at the Bronx Zoo in New York. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think it was resting. So it was, it was just kind of curled up in a corner. So that's, that's all I saw with this little ball of hairy feathers. It doesn't surprise me that the, the nocturnal bird is probably not doing much. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've had really bad luck with uh, kiwi in zoos in my uh, pre prior to that. Like, I went to the the national zoo like dozens of times, perhaps, and they they had a kiwi exhibit, but I never saw their kiwi. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, there was somewhere else. I think the. Um, the San Diego Zoo had when when I visited, I, I also tried to catch their kiwi exhibit, but still, again, no no kiwi. They're they're quite secretive. That's the worst luck. I know. Yeah. <laughs> very very secretive uh, birds. So the stem kiwi that I mentioned or referenced earlier is called Proacteryx, and it's even smaller than the living kiwi. You know, it's something like the size of a pigeon, but it's it's not known for a, from a lot of material. It's known from a femur or thigh bone, I think, and part of the skull. But the people who described it, the researchers who described it, uh, suggest that it might have been able to fly, which is interesting. Well, we'll get to that a bit more later, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I definitely know about the kiwi is that they, they famously, uh, like the elephant bird, mm -hmm. have uh, this, these enormous eggs. Ah, uh, yes. Tail, right. That are almost like ridiculous when you consider the the ratio of egg to body yeah right right yeah i think they have relative to body size i think they have the largest eggs of any bird if i'm remembering correctly and yeah and obviously a kiwi is much smaller than an elephant bird so that egg really does take up a huge proportion of its body when the female is getting ready to lay so yeah, yeah. for the, the that gestation i do not know off the top of my head but uh, that would be interesting to look into later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. I, yeah, and because of this giant egg, uh, a popular uh, idea was actually that the kiwi evolved from a much bigger ancestor with a much bigger egg, and it just kind of kept this egg as it shrunk. But uh, this Miocene stem kiwi seems to suggest that this is not the case, that they actually had smaller ancestors. So what is the good of such a large egg? I guess it's not entirely clear at the moment. And then, okay, I guess we can move to the next slide. We'll look at the other New Zealand paleonate group. Unfortunately, uh, is not with us anymore. Uh, these are the MOA. And the MOA are known from very fragmentary fossils from the Miocene onward, but mostly we know them from recent remains. And they have been extinct since at least the 15th century, only a couple centuries after human arrival on New Zealand. Uh, there have, of course, as usual, been rumored sightings of MOA long after their widely accepted extinction date. But, of course, uh, unfortunately, these sightings are typically not very well substantiated, to say the least. Oh, yeah, leave it to us to make the MOA a cryptid. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the MOA were quite diverse. There, are, there were nine recent species. And we classify them in three main groups, the, the Megalopterygidae, Megalopterygidae, I guess, uh, the upland moa, which was actually one of the smaller species of moa, and it lived up in mountainous regions. Apparently it was fairly agile for moa. Uh, the moa mostly have relatively stocky limbs. Uh, in fact, uh, this, this 
um, the species pictured here is not one of the stockier species of moa. There, there are some species of moa with really ridiculously thick limbs. Uh, there's one that actually has a species name uh, Elephantopus because of how thick its leg limbs are. The elephant-footed uh, moa. <laughs> so the um, the upland moa is on, only one species on the smaller moa species. Uh, then there are the the Maidae, which are what we call the lesser moa. So, uh, they're mostly called lesser moa because they're smaller than the third group, the giant moa, the Dionithidae, which is a, a species of which is pictured here. Of course, the giant moa are the biggest of, of these moa species. Uh, they can get up to... If the, if the neck was extended like this, it, they could probably get up to like three meters tall or something like that. So one of the tallest birds that we know about. Uh, they they weren't as massive as the elephant birds though, so they they were uh, over two hundred kilograms in weight, so not quite as massive as the elephant birds, but still very big birds. Something really weird about the moa is that their forelimbs are completely lost, completely lost. Uh, so they they do have a little bit of the shoulder girdle left, but yeah, there's no arm, no hand, nothing, wow. no wings at all. They're just fully committed to flightlessness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it's, as far as we know, they're the only uh, birds that exhibit such extreme forelimb reduction. Some, uh, something else that's kind of interesting about moa is that they show, I think, the most dramatic sexual size dimorphism of any bird that we know about. Um, so in most paleonates, the females are bigger than the males. But in moa, this is taken to an extreme, especially in the giant moa, in Dinornis. Um, the females were almost three times heavier than the males. And this actually caused a lot of uh, taxonomic troubles in, in the past, because it, a lot of uh, moa species were uh, named based on differing sizes. But then people finally were able to analyze their DNA and found oh, actually, these are the same species. It's just that some of them are much bigger than the others. And as it turns out, the bigger ones are the females. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so why, why were the males smaller? It's, it's, it's possible um, this is because, the you know, again, paleonates, most paleonates, uh, the males are the ones taking care of the young. And so the males, in this case, probably were the ones that were sitting on the nests and sitting on top of the eggs to keep them warm. And of course, uh, you know, you don't want to be too heavy if you're sitting on top of a bunch of eggs. Yeah, right. And like in Madagascar, some New Zealand plants have those same features we discussed earlier uh, that seem to be defenses against large herbivorous birds. So that's, that's uh, the fact that we see these features in both of these places seems to support this idea that these are, you know, evolutionary anachronisms. In fact, um, it was first uh, suggested for moa before being discovered um, in, in the Malagasy plants. We know quite a lot about moa biology, um, and we see on this next slide here, uh, this is because, or in, in part because there are some exceptional remains known for moa. Um, so these are the remains of an upland moa found in a cave, I think. And you can see that the soft tissues are still there, kind of dried up. Uh, you can see that, you know, the f soft tissues of the foot and the head, in this case, are still preserved. That is incredible. Yeah, amazing, right? It's like I, it died not that long ago. <laughs> I think if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. um, this is kind of a funny thing. Yep. That, that foot, mm -hmm. in particular, of the moa uh, was an internet meme for a while because people were sharing it for... For like the wrong reasons. Yeah. Like, I was about to bring that up, actually. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was like a. Uh, oh, here we found a preserved foot of a dinosaur. It's incredible, and it's like, yeah, that's true. Since you know, moa are dinosaurs. Right. People are probably like having something else in their head. Like, yes. Yes. Dinosaur. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. I, I. Yes. I remember that quite quite well. There was there was an internet meme going around with a photo of his foot. Yeah, basically saying, look at this intact foot of a dinosaur preserved for millions of years. And it's like, yes, it is the foot of a dinosaur, but it's 
probably you know a few centuries old <laughs> not not, <laughs> not millions of years old <laughs> still it's pretty impressive it's absolutely impressive yeah so there are many good specimens known of moa uh, and so they have been very well studied you know in terms of like their genetics and uh what they were eating their biomechanics the um the structure and the color of their feathers even uh we know a lot about moa and uh, definitely too much to really go into much detail here but i've i've tried to cite a number of papers reviewing uh what we know about moa in my reference list yeah i, I believe there's cave art too yeah that's right mm, i think so mm. and they kind of give a, a little idea about how these animals may have held themselves in life yes Yes, yes. Yeah, that's right. I mentioned how if the neck was held, you know, way up erect, uh, they could get up to three meters tall. But according to the cave art, at least, it seems that they probably more, most of the time were holding their necks down closer to the ground. They kind of parallel, uh, or not, not quite, but almost parallel with the body. So a bit like, you know, if you remember the cassowary photo earlier or something like that, where the neck kind of arches up in front of the, the body and not being held up high above it. Yeah. Yep. So those are the MOA. And last but not least, although I guess they're the least in the sense that they are the smallest known paleonates, um, are the Tindamus. The Tindamus don't have a very, very good fossil record, although there are very fragmentary fossils of them known from the Miocene onwards. And they're definitely the most diverse group of living paleonates, with over 40 living species known. They're found in South America, and their main claim to fame is that they're the only paleonates, the living paleonates at least, that can fly. The thing is, though, that they are not, uh, I guess, they're not considered to be very good at flying. And in fact, they prefer not to fly when they can get away with it. <laughs> Gotta fit in with the others somehow. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've, um, I've only seen tinamus in zoos before, but from what I've heard is that, you know, if you approach a tinamu in the wild, uh, they prefer to run away from you and try to hide in the foliage instead of flying. They'll pretty much only fly if they absolutely have to. And when they fly, it's only in short bursts. They can take. They are able to take off very quickly from the ground. Um, and so we call them this burst flight. So they, they're able to take off very quickly from the ground and then get some distance away and then disappear back into the some the foliage usually. Right. But, uh, I've never been able to see tinamus either. Yeah, right. But... Uh, I do know that there, there's evidence to suggest that some Mesoamerican groups treated them in the same way as, as chickens. <laughs> they, they were sort of an animal that was raised, again, like cassowaries. Yeah, yeah. By and then later eaten. <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. And they, you know, they are superficially quite chicken-like. So yeah, that doesn't doesn't hugely surprise me. Um, but yeah, even though they can fly, they they're not very agile in flight. In fact, uh, people often talk about how they often crash into obstacles when they're flying. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> yeah, they, they also can't fly for very long. Um, their hearts are actually, relative to their body size, smaller than those of other birds. So they, they don't have very good endurance. So pretty much they, the only thing they use flight to do is to you know quickly put distance between themselves and a predator if they need to. Um, and in some cases, they also fly up into trees to rest. But other than that, yeah, they they don't they don't like to fly very much. All right, so let's talk a bit about the you know evolution of paleonates. So now that we've met all these recent paleonate groups, the traditional view, reasonably enough, uh, was that all of the flightless groups were more closely related to each other than to the tinamus. You know, tinamus retained uh, flight from a flying ancestor because we know the common and last common ancestor of crowned birds must have been flight capable uh, tinamus retained this ability but then there was this other lineage that lost this ability and that gave rise to all these different flightless groups the ratites this is what we thought and it seemed to make sense obviously all the most of these ratites look quite similar to each other and under this assumption there was a little bit of an interesting conundrum because none of these birds can fly but they're found in very uh, distant parts of the world from each other right we have ostriches in africa rias in south america 
uh, cassowaries and emus in um, Australasia, elephant birds in Madagascar, and kiwi and moa on New Zealand. So how did they get there? And the classic explanation, which was turned into textbook wisdom, was that ratites attained this distribution through a phenomenon called vicariance. And that's when basically lineages split, um, not because these animals move to different areas, but through the formation of geographic barriers separating them. And the idea was that the last common ancestor of ratites originated on the southern supercontinent of Gondwana, because all of the, these paleonates are found in the southern hemisphere. And as Gondwana split apart, uh, it gave rise to all these different lineages that started independently evolving once they became isolated from each other. And this seemed to make sense. And again, was found in textbooks and in fact, even today is still widely uh, repeated in, in you know, popular texts and uh, yes, textbooks and even, you know, university courses. I, I know from personal experience uh, that, yeah, it is, it is still taught in some university courses. Well, what has your experience been? Oh, yeah, I, I've definitely caught this here and there um, in, in, in popular science books. Right, um, right. Mm. Like the, the most recent example that I can think of was the Big History book by Dorlin Kindersley. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's, it's a great book. But they had a couple like slip ups here. Right, One right. of them was the promotion of this idea. Yes. Mm. Kind of like, oh my God, this again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, this is a traditional view, and it's easy to see why it became, you know, a well established viewpoint. Um, it makes a lot of intuitive sense. But. Then we started doing molecular phylogenetics, and I show on this next slide here our current understanding of paleonate phylogenetics based on molecular phylogenetics. Now there, there is still a little bit of uncertainty about the exact relationships here. Uh, mostly the uncertainty surrounds the position of the rhea and the moa tinamu clade. So some studies find that the rhea is you know, more distantly related to the Cassariforms and Kiwi than the Tinamus are. So I guess in, in that case, they would swap positions on this tree. So I, I followed a fairly recent uh, paleonate phylogeny here, but there is a little bit of lingering uh, controversy about it. Nonetheless, that, that's not really uh, central to the point. Um, the key thing here is that it turns out that the Tinamus are not equally close to all the flightless paleonates, but are actually most closely related to the moa. <laughs> Who saw that coming? <laughs> yeah. All the way in, in, in New Zealand. <laughs> right. So what this implies, well, either there was a flightless common ancestor of all living paleonates, and then it regained flight in the lineage leading to Tinamus, which is something that, as far as we know, has never happened in any other group of birds. Or, uh, flight was lost independently several times in the Paleonates, which we do know happens in some bird groups. And so now the current consensus is that there were independent origins of flightlessness in uh, each of the flightless paleonate groups, which I show on the next slide here. Now, you might think, well, okay, uh, so the ostriches lost flight once and then the moa lost flight once, but how about this remaining group here with the rias and cassuariforms and the elephant birds and the kiwi? Like they, they could have still had a last common ancestor that was uh, flightless, right? Because they, they were, they're all flightless. Well, uh, obviously in theory it's possible, but when you look at the biogeography of these groups, that starts seeming a lot less likely. So on the next slide here, I have uh, compared, I kind of, you know, put this phylogeny next to a, a, a diagram showing the sequence in which Gondwana broke up. 
So, uh, the earliest here is on top, 160 million years ago in the Jurassic, we have Gondwana. The first major landmass to break off here is um, Africa and Madagascar and also India. Okay, so the ostrich lineage branches off first. That seems to be consistent. Next, in the Cretaceous, New Zealand breaks off. Okay, leading to the Moa. Sure. But then, uh, South America and Australia break off from Antarctica. Okay, Rias and Caesariforms, and wait! What about the elephant birds and the kiwi, right? If the elephant birds uh, originated through the continental breakup, they had to have split off way back, you know, earlier when Madagascar was splitting off from Gon the rest of Gondwana. And the kiwi would have also need needed to split off earlier too. So the patterns that we see in the phylogeny compared to biogeography indicates that most likely, uh, these birds did not lose flight, you know, uh, just once at the base of this flightless group, but also independently dispersed these different landmasses from uh, flying ancestors and became flightless independently. And furthermore, people have done molecular clock studies on paleonates, and they found that probably most of these splits occurred too late for, um, you know, the, them to have originated through continental breakup. And we, we talked about um, molecular clocks in the previous lecture uh, and how there are many caveats to them. But nonetheless, you know, when several lines of evidence converge with each other, uh, I think it's relatively safe to go with this explanation that there were independent losses of flight. Oh yeah, that, that makes absolute sense to me. Um, I, I was just thinking, like, yeah, even though you have this group here, the rays, cassoir form, and so forth, that you might think, oh, well, you know, they got flightless once and then just inherited that. But mm -hmm. then you just talked about Proapteryx. Right. Which yes. had, you know, wings that could fly, maybe. So, you know, it's only a matter of time until <laughs> we get more fossil evidence that backs up this independent flying origin thing. Right. Even, you know, got to find that, that um, cassowary with wings and... <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. I mentioned that uh, so far we only have crown cassariform fossils, but, you know, if we find a stem cassariform, maybe it'll help us uh, shed, you know, help shed light on this uh, problem even more. And so, uh, the current uh, leading hypothesis is not that the distribution of these birds was not uh, the result of vicarians, but through dispersal. So these animals were actually, you know, their, their ancestors actually moved to these land masses from somewhere else. All right. Yeah, and this um, this actually is the origin of the title of this lecture, Goodbye Gondwana, because there's a very, very traditional and deeply entrenched idea that New Zealand is kind of this uh, time capsule in the middle of the Pacific that preserves, uh, you know, the life forms that were living on there uh, from all the way back in the Mesozoic era. That all of these, um, you know, uh, many of the life forms found on New Zealand today uh, originated during the breakup of, uh, of New Zealand from the rest of Gondwana and have kind of remained there ever since, kind of remaining, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, they will uh, they will um, promote New Zealand as kind of this uh, this remnant, uh, this lost world, uh, preserving uh, Gondwana's uh, you know history and all that. But um, more recently, uh, it has been found you know not not only for the paleonates but also for many of the other groups endemic to New Zealand that it, it is more likely um, many, if not all, from. Uh, most of their uh, distinctive uh, organisms actually dispersed there relatively recently and were not, you know, remnants of this Mesozoic world. So it's oh, a very, yeah, yeah go I've on. Definitely, yeah, I've definitely seen that in older literature too. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, I think it, it's still pretty widely touted. It's kind of a tourism draw. Um, and, but, you know, uh, it, it's a very attractive idea, but it doesn't seem to be currently favored 
by the evidence. And so in a famous uh, commentary piece uh, written in the journal of Biogeography in 2005, um, the piece was titled Goodbye Gondwana. And it was basically about this paradigm shift that no, the origins of the New Zealand uh, life forms are mostly not explained by, you know, being remnants of Gondwana, but through, uh, you know, dispersal from many other parts of the world. And uh, I think they, they ended that commentary, the author ended that commentary, saying something like, well, you know, flypaper of the Pacific is not as attractive an idea as time capsule. <laughs> But that doesn't mean, you know, it's not an interesting story. And uh, uh, em embracing the, this new viewpoint is not only more reflective of the evidence, but also is evocative in its own right. Oh, yeah, you don't have to romanticize anything to make it interesting. Right, right. <laughs> so they, he, ba he basically ended the commentary saying, it's time to say goodbye to Gondwana. So that, that's where the title of my lecture comes from. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so that a lot of that uh, reshuffling was, uh, you know, kickstarted by molecular evidence. But what do we know from the fossil record about the history of paleonates? For most of those groups I mentioned earlier, um, their definite fossil record doesn't go much further than the Miocene, which is relatively recent. So there's still quite a, you know, few gaps for us to fill there. But we do have some insight into early evolution of paleonates, possibly, from the fossil record. And this is uh, in large part because of this group called the Lithornithids. And the Lithornithids are known from quite a good number of fossils from Europe and North America. That's interesting, right? Because modern paleonates are only found in the Southern Hemisphere, but the Lithornithids were found in the Northern Hemisphere. So yet another example of you shouldn't assume that uh, the current distribution of an organism has always been the way it is. Uh, they're known from very early in the paleogene, so in the Paleocene and Eocene epochs. They are known from, yeah, I, I mentioned that they're known from many good fossils. So this is an example. This is a cast of a specimen that is unfortunately in a private collection. Uh, which I picked because it was available on Wikipedia and also because you can see, you know, most of the bones quite clearly in this cast. But there are other examples of very well-preserved lithorendithid fossils that are in, you know, uh, museum collections. Something interesting about the lithorendithids is that they were almost certainly flight-capable. They have all the features you would expect to see in a flying bird. And in fact, their wings um, are quite a bit lo relatively longer than those of tinamous. So they probably were not limited to the, like, the short bursts of flight that tinamous are. They were probably very good flyers, in fact. Uh, a quite recent study modeled based on the shape of their wings because we, we have wing feathers preserved in some of these specimens. Um, that uh, is quite likely they were very suited to what we call continuous flapping flight. So uh, this was the type of flight that a lot of the pigeons and ducks use. So they are able to fly very strongly by constantly flapping their wings. Um, and so this potentially could have allowed uh, Lithornithids to fly quite long distances and even migrate, perhaps. Uh, something else that makes them different from Tinamous is that uh, they had a relatively long beak. In Tinamous, the beak is often quite short, but in Lithornithids, the beak is fairly long and slender, and people have suggested that they could have forged by probing, a little bit like the kiwi that we talked about earlier, but maybe not quite as extreme as that. In fact, uh, the impressions of the inside of the skull, so the brain cavity of Lithornithids, suggests that they also had a very good sense of smell, because a part of the brain that is devoted to the sense of smell is quite large in Lithornithids. So perhaps this is consistent with a probing uh, foraging method. And also their hallux, so the innermost, the little, the little toe, uh, well, equivalent to our big toe uh, on lithornithids, is, you know, not, not super long, but it's longer than other paleonates. We mentioned earlier how a lot of paleonates have actually lost the hallux entirely, but in the lithornithids, it's still reasonably well developed. So they could probably perch in tree branches and things like that. And obviously, most of the paleonates today are way too big to perch in a tree at all. Oh, um, yeah, like the furthest from modern paleonates as you can get. Right, right. 
<laughs> yeah, so pretty much only the little flying tinamous are uh, spend uh, might spend some of their times in in trees today among the living paleonates. Now the phylogenetic position of lithornithids has been pretty controversial. So they they do have the distinctive um, paleonate palate, but um, some people have suggested that oh maybe this is you know a pr ancestral primitive feature. And that maybe they're not even crown birds at all. There might be, you know, stem birds that are closely related to crown birds. Uh, which is, you know, I, I wouldn't rule out that possibility. Although, uh, as we shall see, it's not what most of the recent studies seem to suggest. Uh, it has also been quite popular to suggest that they were stem tinamous. And they do have some tinamou-like features. Though, again, uh, they're also quite different in some other ways. But it is possible that, you know, uh, the similarities between tinamous and lithornithids is a kind of an artificial one uh, in that, you know, they just happen to retain a lot of similar features because they, because they can both fly, whereas the other paleonates are so transformed, you could say, for flightlessness that um, it's not, uh, that the lith lithornithids don't seem as similar to them anymore, if that makes sense. Okay. But... Most of the recent studies that have studied the position of lithornithids suggest that they were stem paleonates, which would make a lot of sense, I think. So they would not be part of the modern paleonate radiation, but they would kind of be these er early offshoots of the, the lineage leading to the modern paleonates. And so this might imply that all living paleonates descended from a lithornithid-like ancestor. And, well, what does this mean for their, you know, biogeography and hypotheses about how they are attain their current distribution? Again, lithornithids show evidence of being very good flyers. So it is, seems entirely plausible that a lithornithid-like ancestor could disperse to all of these different parts of the world and give rise to all the modern uh, paleonate lineages. Do you have anything else to add to that? No, I think it makes perfect sense. Um, I, it's easy to like look at a fossil like this and, and tell that this animal it, it was very easy to fly from place to place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're definitely uh, quite interesting birds. So uh, on the next slide, I've shown kind of the current consensus of where lithornithids go. So yeah, they are equally related to all the living paleonate groups. So they're not crown paleonates, probably they are more likely stem paleonates. Now, before I wrap up, I guess there's this other kind of group of early paleonates that is worth mentioning because they're known from good fossils. Um, these are the paleotidids. So far, they're only known definitely from Europe. Uh, there are fossils that may be paleotidid-like birds from North America. It's a bit uncertain. They're only known from the pale, um, sorry, the Eocene so far. And the paleotidids, unlike the lithornithids, were flightless birds. So this is Paleotis, which is the best known example of a paleotidid. It's known from uh, Europe, uh, Germany specifically. Uh, interestingly, uh, the wings are relatively long here. And so I, right now I'm using my cursor to point to the wings. So sorry if you can't see it, Joan, but... Uh, <laughs> In any case, the the wings are the wings are relatively long, even though it's a flightless bird. So in this respect, um, uh, they are they are similar to the rheas and the ostriches. Uh, they're relatively small; they're about a meter tall, I think. So you know, not not quite as big as an ostrich or the larger uh, rheas. But uh, they were flightless, and they also have quite long hind limbs. So they seem to have been cursorial. Which is pretty interesting because um, we know from you know the sedimentology of where they are preserved that they probably lived in forested habitats and usually uh, it is the birds that live in more open habitats that are uh, more specialized for running. But um, paleotidids seem to have been you know these running flightless birds that were living in forests. Pretty interesting. Hmm. Well, you mentioned the cassowaries are right sort of forest living too. So. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Too too far fetched. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there's some some precedent for that. Um, 
the relationships of paleotides to living paleonates is not clear. So uh, traditionally, uh, it has been thought that maybe they were stem ostriches, which is plausible because, again, they, they have these similar features. And uh, living in Europe puts them pretty, you know, relatively close geographically to where we would expect ostriches to be originating. But it's, it's not really clear. Um, people have done phylogenetic analyses recently, um, including paleotides, and they, they don't really come out in a particularly consistent position in the paleonate tree. So, so far it is still a mystery. Um, it might be that they actually represent yet another example of independent flight business in paleonates. Who knows? Uh, but until we find kind of maybe the uh, a transitional uh, fossil that shows uh, the flighted ancestor that potentially gave rise to paleotides or maybe another um, flightless paleonate group, um, it is probably quite difficult to tell from the very modified uh, flightless forms how they're, they're related to each other. All right, um, let's see. There are some other possible paleonate uh, fossils known from the Paleogene period, uh, but most of them are pretty fragmentary. Uh, there, there's one called like Rebiornis from France, which is known from a few leg bones. There's a large bird called uh, Eremopezis from uh, Africa, which is known from a few other leg bones. Um, but they're, they're super fragmentary. It's not really possible to uh, tell their relationships to modern paleonates with much certainty. It's not even clear that uh, they really are paleonates, especially in the case of Eremopezis. So um, no, I won't go into too much detail about them here. But other than that, I think I've finally finished my uh, um, you know introduction to paleonates. Uh, do you have anything else to add? Uh, I think it's pretty fascinating that if we take the whole group in total, mm -hmm. perhaps that some of these fossil forms do end up belonging to the group. Yeah. Paleonates have a much more worldwide distribution than we usually think. Yeah. <laughs> That's just fascinating to me. Right, right. Absolutely. And again, yeah, one of the reasons the traditional kind of vicarious view uh, gained a lot of traction is that, well, you know, all the modern paleonates are found in the southern hemisphere, so it made a lot of sense that they originated on the Gondwanan supercontinent. But uh, with these fossil forms that are now known, uh, we find that it's not so simple. There used to be paleonates in the northern hemisphere too, so I guess where paleonates actually originated it's, it's still an open question, and we kind of saw that with uh, when discussing the origins of crown birds and as a whole last time as well. I guess it's an interesting thing too, now that I'm thinking about it, mm -hmm. if their dispersal was so, um, well, uh, this might not be the appropriate term, but if there's just, the, their dispersal works so well to take them to all these different places, yeah. you know, to fly to these far off islands and such, you know, it makes me wonder why these particular birds died out mm -hmm. while the other, you know, while the neonates sort of rose to prominence yeah that's a that's a very good question and actually we will see in many uh, neonate groups that uh, a somewhat similar pattern uh, is seen in some of them uh, where we have um, fossil representatives that come from the northern hemisphere of groups today that are restricted to the southern hemisphere and so it seems likely that all of these groups went through something quite similar and maybe due to climate changes that um, formerly during the Paleogene, the climate in the Northern Hemisphere was very favorable to them. But uh, as climate changed, um, you know, conditions became less so and they just were wiped out from the Northern Hemisphere and became more limited to other parts of the world. So uh, we, we will see that pattern come up again in later lectures in this series. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I look forward to hearing about them. Yeah, for sure. Hmm. Okay, uh, is that um, is that all? Yep, that should be it. All right. Hmm. So I guess a brief uh, intro to next time. So next time we're going to start looking into the other major lineage of uh, crown birds, and that is, of course, the neonates. Now, the neonates are so diverse that um, it's going to take the rest of the series to get through their diversity. <laughs> There are over 10,000 species of living birds and only, you know, less than 60 of them are paleonates. So that gives you an idea of how diverse the neonates are. 
we will start out with one particular group of the neonates. Though the neonates, in turn, as we also discussed last time, split into two major lineages. One of these is the Gallo and Serre. The other is neo -Aves. neo -Aves is a more diverse group. It includes over 95% of all living birds. But the Gallo and Serre have definitely done a lot of very interesting things. And this is the group that includes both chickens and ducks. So economically they're, and culturally, they're certainly very important to us. Oh, yeah. And so next time on Dinosaurs, the second chapter, we are going to get to our chickens and ducks in a row. And we will meet some of their uh, possibly quite scary looking giant extinct relatives as well. Oh, and awesome. Yeah. <laughs> With that, I guess uh, it's time for us to wrap up. As usual, uh, the music is done by our friend Henry. The color scheme for my avatar is done by my friend Alicia. And follow us on Twitter and YouTube if you like our content. Uh, keep up to date with new releases. You can email us with questions if you have any uh, regarding the subjects that we talk about. And if, as usual, I will include a list of links to references for this episode in the description. If that is all, uh, I guess... Have a good one, everybody, and stay safe. Yes, we'll definitely see you next time for part two of my series on human evolution. Um, oh, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be another good one. Yeah, talk I, about primates. So I look forward to seeing everybody for that too. I look forward to hearing about it. Excellent. So now I'll be next week. See you then. Bye, everybody.